Isn't it good? I love to hear contemporary Christian music. There are a lot of good songs that are on the radio, but it is great, great, great to get back in the hymn book. I love to hear things. Go back and you can tag on that song that he just sang. Tell me the story of Jesus. Sweeter than ever. Have you ever been in a situation where you have no idea where, how, or what is going to be your next step? I believe that John chapter 6, John chapter 3, John chapter 1 is talking about the coming Messiah, telling us who Jesus is. Uh, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it continues to talk about in chapter 1 how uh, John the Baptist was come to tell about the coming Messiah. Behold, comes the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Then we dive into John chapter 2, and it begins with the miracles of of Jesus changing the water into wine and and seeing the things that's going on. Then we move from that to uh, healing the paralegic. Then we move, excuse me, move from that to um, Nicodemus in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then we move from John chapter 3 to John chapter 4 and it talks about the the woman at the well, the Samaritans that are looked down on by the Jews as an outcast. But what does it say in John chapter 4? That Jesus must needs to go through Samaria. Why must he need to go through Samaria? Because he knew when and where and what time that woman was going to be there that was in need of a Savior. Then we move to to John chapter 5. It begins the the miracle of the paralegic. It begins the, the miracle of others. Then we go into John chapter 6 and we see the most famous scripture that most everyone has heard about. The feeding of the 5,000. How many of you heard that story when you were a child in grade school? How How many of you at the age where you're at now have felt like you've heard all that it has to say. Man, I I can tell you that in reading and studying the Bible that I never want to get to that point where I think I know all about the Scripture. Oh, you can you can read through John and we'll continue to go in through John and, and continue to dive into verse six. Uh, chapter 6, and there's a bunch of stuff that is going on through in chapter 6. I don't know if we'll get through chapter 6 before the end of the year. I really want you to study chapter 6 and see what's all going on. There is a lot of stuff going on in chapter 6, and I believe... I can be wrong, and if I am wrong, please come tell me so I can be on the right path. But I see John chapter 6 as a chapter of faith. You see that that it's not about the feeding of the 5,000, which is a great story, which is a great testimony of how faithful God is. But I don't think it's as much about the five loaves and the two fishes as it is Jesus challenging the the disciples about their faith. 
Then it moves from the faith of the five loaves and the two fishes to a raging sea. Testing the faith. So I'm going to ask that question again. Has there ever been a time in your life, has there ever been a time in your days where you don't know where you're going to take or how you're going to take your next step? Can I tell you, while I prepared this message, while I uh, read through these scriptures, and this is not about me, this is about God. Five minutes ago, I didn't know how I was going to start my introduction. Where is your faith in God? Three messages we have tied through in these uh, 13 verses. First was test of faith. Last week was little as much when God is in it, but it was talking about being filled with, a, with Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't as much about the provision of the food that he gave the people, but it was about himself that he broken and died and, and rose again for us, that we will be filled with the Holy Spirit. We will be filled with, with his love and his mercy. What does it say in Colossians? Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. What are you filled with this morning? what we was talking about last week. This week, we wanted to look at verse 12 and verse 13. I'll try to get to verse 15. But as I was reading verse 12 and verse 13, the, the word, one word that stood out to me this week is fragments. Could not get past the word fragments. Why? If you look up the word for fragment, the, the definition for fragment, it means broken. Yes, it's talking about how Jesus took the five loaves and the two fishes from the lad and he fed 5,000 men. What a miracle. But it doesn't stop there because it wasn't just 5,000 men. It was their families. So we're looking about from 5,000 to 20,000 people. I want you to imagine this grassy knoll. He says in verse 10, make them sit down. Make them sit down. Philip couldn't even imagine. Jesus, do you see how many people was on that hill? There is no possible way. But what does it say in verse 8 and 9? He did it to test him because he knew what he was going to do. I think it's verse 6 and 7. Listen, listen. Sorry. He already knew what he was going to do. He asked this question to test him. And not only Philip, but Andrew, uh, Simon Peter's brother. He said, hey, we, we got this boy over here that has five loaves and two fishes. But what in the world is that among so many? Can I tell you with men, everything is pretty much impossible. But with God, all things are possible. So I want us to focus on this word today. Not as much as fragments as word. But the definition of being broken. I want you to really look and to pay attention what it means to be broken. You know the song that I sing all the time? I, I love this song. I can remember it from a boy. He's still working on me to make me what I used to be. I need to be. Took me, took him just a week to make the sun and the, how's it go? Somebody help me. He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How lovely and patient he must be because he's still working on me. 
I want you to think about that. And I, in this picture here that, that keeps coming to my mind, and the disciples had to be told over and over and over and over and over again, quit worrying about the stuff and have faith and trust in me. Oh, I was reading through chapter 6, and we were talking. Hey, I'm telling you, I have a great time at school Thursday evening. Me and Mr. Bob and, and Brian Hollyfield and, and uh, another guy, Lao Tu, we have some great conversations. And we got to speak this week a little bit about John chapter 6, how everything's going on in John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000, the faith of, of the disciples that, that Jesus is trying to get them to understand. You have to have faith. Quit putting your trust in things that will not last. But then we got to talking about how when Jesus calmed the sea. I believe in John chapter 6, this is the first time that Jesus is really fo focusing in on the faith. What it means to have faith in God. If we get to the boat where Jesus is resting, you know the part where Jesus is resting in the boat. And the waves start to go. And you understand that these people are professional fishermen. So they have been into storms. They have been in storms fishing. So it had to be a major storm to make them afraid. And we were sitting there talking about this. And, and Mr. Bob, he said, you know, that is such a great lesson here. Because... We think when we're looking at the fishermen were in a boat fishing, we think of these big shrimp boats or these big, uh, these big fishing boats that has the upper deck and the lower deck. He said, but do you understand that in, most, in that culture, most of the boats were uh, 12 to 16 foot long, a single hole boat with a couple seats. And when they were so afraid about the the water, the storm, it was a test to see where their faith was. Jesus was about 8 to 10 feet away from them, laying in the boat resting. And they came to Jesus franicking. What in the world are we going to do? But they came to Jesus helpless and broken. We've been, Lord, we've been in storms. We've been in all these troubles. We've been in troubled waters before, but we don't know how to fix it. Jesus wants us to come to him helpless and broken. What happened next in that story? He got up and said what? Peace be still. And if you'll read on in that story, what manner of man is this? I want you to think about the fragments of your life. I want you to think about the things that are going on in your life. Do you understand there's nothing going on in, your, on in your life that takes God by surprise? Mr. Kim, I'm, I'm going to pick on you a minute, and don't take this the hard, wrong way. Because there's several of us in here like this. Mr. Kim don't have much hair on his head, nor do I. But do you understand that God knows how many hairs are on our head? He knows when the sparrow falls. And you see the animals. You see all these animals that can't work for their food, but they are provided for. If God can take care of things that are around us that have no means to taking care of their self, then what is it to think that he can't take care of you and me? I want you to think about the broken pieces. Let's dive into the Scripture. We'll go back to verse 10. Man, we're late. It's 12, 12 by this clock right here. Verse 10 says, Then Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so men sat down in numbers about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves... 
And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down and likewise of the fish as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, we talked about that last week. So when they were filled, what does that mean? They got all they needed for every situation that they needed. We, we talked about last week how in that culture there were many poor people. And probably for the first time, what some of the commentators say, probably for the first time they have ever felt full. How full are you this morning of the things Jesus wants you to do? How full are you are of his word? How full of you are uh, of the things that he wants you to do and how you, he wants you to do it? Verse 12, so when they were full, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remain so nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Stay there for real quick for a little bit. So let's go back to verse 12. It says, so when they were filled, when everybody had everything that they wanted, everything that they needed to uh, be filled, be uh, provided for, he said to the disciples, gather up the fragments that remained so nothing was lost. Let's go to verse 10 real quick, and I'm going to tie this together. It says, then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass, so men sat down, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples, and the disciples to those sitting down, and likewise the fish as much as they wanted. So he said, gather up the fragments which were remain. What happened in Corinthians when we talked about last week in, in the Lord's Supper? When he blessed, broke the bread and blessed them, he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. I want you to look at this. I, I really want you to think about this. And I talked about it last week, how the commentators say that there's some people said that they, the disciples had friends that were bakers, that was baking the bread, getting ready for this feast. They were fishermen by trade, and they were fishing, getting ready for this feast. And then they stuffed all the food into the caves. And then that, when Jesus was ready to feed these people, they just come up, and the disciples slipped the food up under Jesus' robe, and Jesus handed them the food. Let me, let me tell you one problem with that. What happened in verse 10? Look at verse 10. It says, make the people sit down. They did not walk up to a cave. They did not slip any bread up under Jesus' robe because Jesus said, make them sit down. Jesus came to them where they were sitting. And can I tell you, it would take more faith to believe. Hang on a minute. It would be more or less unexplainable to explain they knew how many people they were going to have to feed. And they knew how many people in the bakery could make the bread, how much fish they were going to need, and how many people it would take to catch that much fish. I want you to understand what's going on here. There was five, five to fifteen to 20,000 people there. Miss Angela, how much food would you have to prepare for that? You have no idea, nor do I. I can't even fathom how much to feed 500. It's time for us to understand that we can trust God. If he has enough power to turn five loaves and two fishes into enough food for all to be filled with, 
He has enough power to do anything that is broken in your life. And I want, I want you to see another thing right here. He says, gather up the fragments that remain. He had leftovers. I'm not talking about leftovers that was eaten off of, where we take food and scrape it into a trash can that was left over that wasn't eaten. He had uh, leftovers. He had fragments that remained. If the people made fish sandwiches, he had fish sandwiches left over that had not been eaten. The fragments. Not leftovers like we say. We can eat off a turkey after Thanksgiving for five days. That's not what he's talking about. Fresh food, fish, fresh bread, fresh fish that was left over. The remains, so nothing is lost. Verse 13, therefore they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five, bar- five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. Now, I know this doesn't matter, but this is how my mind works. How many baskets would he would have to have to feed five, uh, five to 15 to 20,000 people? Now, was it like the, the oil canisters and in, in the widow in, in Elijah's day where the oil just kept coming? Was it like that? We don't know. But I think it's amazing that, that the boy had five loaves and two fishes. And it doesn't mention anything in the story in Matthew and Mark or Luke about where the baskets came from. Now, that might not be a big deal for you, but that's how my mind works. I, I really want to dig in and I really want to see the, the power but do you understand in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 1 Corinthians, it might be 2, uh, 5, 7. We walk by faith, not by sight. Do you understand where the stuff come from wasn't as important as, as who provided the stuff? Now, I understand it's amazing to, to really dig, Mr. Dana, dig into, into culture, history, and, and things like that and to find out what's going on in the story. But the things that matter is who the one is doing the miracle. Can I tell you, Mr. Harvey, that the doctors cannot do anything to you that God has not supplied the, the purpose and the provision and the, and the medical assistance? Nothing in their power. So the baskets is not important. The fragments are not important. But the God who heals the broken, the God who takes the pieces and minds it back together and mends it back together to make it what he wants it to be. He's still working on me. He's still working on you. The broken pieces. We bought by faith, not by sight. What do you think the disciples said? What did he, he say? Was it in verse 9, Miss Melissa, where he asked Philip, verse 8? He asked Philip, and Philip said there would be 200 denarii worth of bread. We would have to buy that much. And then Andrew said, well, we got this boy over here that's got five loaves and two bread, uh, fishes. When they got to verse 12 and verse 13, what do you think the disciples said? What in the world is going on? You and me would be scratching our head. God can do more with your little than you can do with your much. God can do more with your little than you can do with your much. If God has changed you and made you new, and you are a new creature because of Jesus. 
then quit trying. We have to quit trying to figure it out and start trusting him. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Can you look that scripture up? I think it's 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Hebrews 11, 1. Faith is the evidence of things unseen and, and the evidence of things. How does that one go? Faith is the substance of things unseen. And, of th- and the substance of things unseen. Now, faith is the substance, thank you, of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. I want you to imagine. We can't really fathom it, but I want you to imagine the, the minds and the eyes of the disciples that were open of that day. And many more signs did Jesus do with them. But the greatest sign of, the, of all was what he did on the cross. But it wasn't finished there. He said it was finished. The work that he did for the Father, not my will, but thy will be done. The same miracles, the miracles that the disciples saw, he did much more, and he's still doing in me and you. He is risen. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. I want you to catch this real quick. All the signs that the disciples saw Jesus do, where, the, where were the disciples when Jesus was crucified? Where were they? They were scattered. Why? Because they was more focused on what they seen with their eyes instead of who seen them and changed their heart. They were still looking for the signs. You go down to to John chapter 6, and Jesus says, Oh, you didn't come just because you saw something. You came because I filled you with food and you were satisfied. But if you see in, in, uh, I think it's in in verse 1 of chapter 6, they followed him because of the signs that he did. Jesus is not entertainment. He's our Savior. So if you're coming to, for, to Jesus, are you coming looking for Jesus for excitement or for something to give you a rush? Hey, can I tell you, as, as associate pastor, as youth pastor, I went to several youth camps. Do you know how, and I'm not knocking any of the youth. I'm not. But do you know how many youth come back from youth camp fired up and on fire for God? And you know how long that feeling lasts? Hey, I've been there. I'm not picking on the youth because I was there. I was their age. And I'm 45 years old and still, and still sometimes I'm looking for something greater. But can I tell you, greater is he that is in thee? Then he that is in the world, quit looking for the excitement and look to the Savior. These people were so excited. These people were so amazed that he fed me from this little bit of stuff. But most most of them didn't believe. I I can't give you the number. How many believed and how many didn't? But I will tell you at the cross how many were still around him. How many of us today are walking by faith and not by sight? How many of us today are more concerned about the Savior than we are about the excitement? Oh, yeah, it's fun to be excited. The Atlanta Braves won the World Series. I was excited. I was excited. I wouldn't tell you that. I'll tell you I wouldn't. George is on the road to maybe winning a national championship. Yeah, let, let's go on with the message. <laughs> but um, I, I, want, I want you to think about this.
We have to quit being so concerned on what our feelings are or where our emotions are because our emotions run up and down. We need to be more concerned on what he's doing and who he is. The fragments, the broken pieces. Can I tell you, he can take all the pieces that are in your life and put them back together and make you new. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. He can do more with the little than you can with the much. I'm a, I can testify to that. Because I can tell you, that there was some, I'm not going to call names, but there were some of you that were concerned when we had to take out a loan for that air conditioning. In the back of my mind, I was concerned. But I wanted my faith to override my concerns because I can't do it, but he can. It's time for us to to come helpless, to come broken. Because when we come to him already figured out what we're going to do, guess what you're going to do? You're going to fall. You're going to fall. Pride comes before the fall. Come on, Miss Angela. We're going to close with this right here. I don't know where you're at today. I don't know where you will be tomorrow. But the same God that fed the 5,000 can fix every problem that's in your life. Every problem that is in my life. I have no clue if the message was what you needed to hear today, but I'm telling you, it's what I needed to hear. I want to be broken. I want to be helpless. I want to come to Him helpless. Cry out to God. He will change your life. He can change your life. He can make you to be what He wants you to be. He can do more with the little than you can do with the much. Come broken. Hey, the altar's open. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, today is the day. If He's calling you, if the Holy Spirit is dealing with your life, today's the day. I can't make, hey, I can't save you. You can't save me. We don't do the saving. It's Jesus Christ that does the saving. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, the light was the light of the world, Jesus Christ. But if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, today's the day. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But if you are sitting out there and you don't have a clue where your next bill is going to be paid from, you don't have a clue, I, listen, Jesus is not a genie in the bottle. He is a God. He is the Lord and Savior. And can I tell you, He is Lord and Savior, whether you believe He is Lord and Savior or not. You believing in it doesn't make Him Lord and Savior. He's already Lord and Savior. He's not a genie in the bottle. But if you trust Him and surrender, when you trust Him and surrender to Him, He's going to do more in your life than you can do with what there is. Let him take the broken and make it to what he wants it to be. The fragments that are in your life. Surrender to him. Come to him helpless, broken. He will make you what he wants you to be. Father, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, if there's anything that I said today that it was not of you, please let it be. Lord, I pray that I am broken. I pray that that you will mend me and make me what you would have me to be. Lord, just as, as the bread that you provided for these people, the fishes that you provided for these people, Lord, you have saved me, you have made me what you would want me to be. 
Well, it ain't of me. I did nothing. You do everything in and through me. God, I pray for this congregation today. I pray for our community. God, just please help us to be the city that is on the hill, the light of the world, because you are the light of the world. Help us, help the gospel to go out of here. Help us to go out with the gospel and to share the gospel and let the people see you for who you are. Thank you for your love, God. As we sing this song, may our hearts be open, our eyes be open to you. Or may we read the word and let the word read us to be everything you would have us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.